here to show that Russia is not only boring and academic as uh, you might think by the end of the discussion. It's very important that Russia is part of Europe or not. Uh, but I would like to quote my favorite Russian saying that you cannot understand Russia using your mind. You uh, either love it or you hate it. And
Classic Putin. <laughs> Если говорить откровенно, я когда увидел э, на экране что-то такое здесь вот у некоторых на груди, честно вам скажу, ну, неприлично, но тем не менее, я решил, что это э, пропаганда борьбы со спидом, что это такие, пардон, контрацептивы повесили, думаю, зачем развернули, только непонятно. Um, 
he did not take the situation seriously, at least in the media. Um, so who actually went into the streets were, were young people, uh, I see illiterate people who use the internet and, and blogs, and this is um, according to a, a poll that they did among the protesters, they gave a, an example of, uh, of a typical, uh, typical protester in the Russian street. Uh, uh, one of the reasons uh, for the turnout in, in the streets apparently is that uh, the Russian middle class is growing and internet users, the number of internet users grew rapidly since the year 2000. So uh, the, the goal for the demonstration and the communication uh, among the protesters was making place the internet. Here's some more pictures from the, from the demonstrations. What followed was the presidential election on March 4th, 2012. Uh, here you can see the candidates, some of them are um, the usual suspects, Komis Gennady Zdruganov and National Vladimir Zhirovsky, who take uh, part in almost every presidential election. Putin, uh, in response to, to the protests, uh, proposed new measures for the presidential election, which meant transparent boxes and CCTV uh, in all the election rooms. Uh, he invested a lot of money uh, into making sure that he can prove that there is no um, no rigging taking place. However, <laughs> they just found new methods. Uh, so <laughs> some of the examples were last minute polling stations, so they opened new polling stations right in front, uh, before the election, which of course did not have the CCTV and the transparent boxes. Uh, and then uh, there was an issue with uh, enterprises with so-called continuous production cycles, which means that the people can vote uh, at any time and they don't have to register for a particular station, so they just uh, put them all on a bus and took them to several <laughs> stations in the, same, in the same day. But uh, Mr. Putin still got 63.6%, uh, which means that only about 10 to 20% of votes were actually falsified, which in the end means that the majority of the population still did support him. This is his teary-eyed reaction to, uh, to victory, which was followed by a very uh, strong speech. So the question uh, in everybody's mind after the election was whether Russia is headed for a change or not, and how should we interpret optimists? Okay, how should we interpret the developments? Uh, there were optimists and pessimist scenarios uh, that the opposition will go, grow stronger and it will unite, and there will be one opposition leader, and that uh, Putin will start reforming, or he will have new Duma elections because they're both side, or uh, he will have a different prime minister than he do later, or that he will retire. Uh, then the pessimist scenarios where the fuel, on the other hand, climb down against the protesters and take a stronger grip on power, or that he will retire. That's also a pessimist scenario because they fear that then the country would just fall into chaos. Uh, one of the things that did happen was uh, that independent candidates took part in local elections and actually were successful. So you can see one of the local representatives in Moscow, she's 20 years old. So maybe things are headed for a change. But since I only have two minutes, I will skip the post I think since I'm sure everybody <laughs> Uh, it's not uh, 
censorship uh, against uh, against really the public society, but critics fear that it can be used as such. Uh, and the last event uh, in January, a ban on Americans adopting Russian children, which um, mm -hmm. resulted again in protest. But this time, it is only tens of thousands of people, and not hundreds like like last year. So thank you very much. For your Any well, look, I'll just offer a few comments if I could, because I, I think they were, you know, two terrific presentations galloping through, you know, <laughs> 300 years of Russian history, and um, and these terrific presentations like that is. And let me start by saying that, as regards, um, you know, whether uh, Russia is part of Europe or not, um, most Russians would agree with you, sir. Um, if you, if you survey Russian opinion on this question of is Russia, Europe, or something else? I mean, obviously, Russia is both Europe and Asia. I mean, it's absolutely clear. Um, yes, two-thirds of the population were concentrated in European Russia, traditionally defined as to the Urals. Uh, and probably a quarter to a third of the population east of the that, uh, that um, percentage is falling. It's a great worry in Moscow that Siberia and Eastern Russia are depopulated. Eastern Russia, say, should we say, East of Lake Baikal, has lost 15 to 20 percent of the population since the fall of the Soviet Union. And this is really where most of the resources are concentrated. So that's a great worry to people. But as I say, Russians would, I think most Russians would agree with you that Russia is neither Europe nor Asia, Russia is Russia. Um, there's an interesting correlation here um, between political attitudes. The more liberal you are in terms of supporting reform, economic reform, political reform, the more likely you are to stress Russia's European cultural affinities. The more conservative you are, or if you like, the more radical you are in terms of nationalism, the more likely you are to argue that Russia is unique. And Teresa quoted, to my mind, the worst cliche about Russia and the Russian language, which is Russia cannot be measured in any conventional way. Russia is beyond human understanding. Uh, you cannot understand with your mind. In Russia, one can only have faith. What well, this is, of course, mumbo jumbo. We can't understand our Russia with our minds. What can we understand? <laughs> but it, it encapsulates a very common Russian view that Russia is unique. Um, and that is a view which is. Um, it very effectively, but it's a deeply held, sincere belief by many Russians. So I just wanted to make that point. I think you, well, I think that I take your on the question of the Russian language, it, it is a Indo European language, and I think if any of you have tackled it or you do tackle it, you'll find if you've done French or German or Spanish, it would be a great help to you because the, the grammar of the language is undoubtedly Indo European. On the other hand, I agree with you too, so that it is a, a difficult language. And here, the, the, the nature of the language supports your point about Russia being unique because there are all manner of concepts in Russia which reflect its politics and its history, which are very difficult to convey in English. And the link between the Russian language and what you've seen with these two presentations is really very important. Let me illustrate the point. There's a number of English words which simply don't, or concepts, that just don't translate into Russian. Conflict of interest. <laughs> you, you I've checked this with many native Russian speakers, and I say, no, we, a new generation of Russians, the, you know, the post-Soviet generation, 
young people who've traveled in Europe and studied abroad, they understand what it means. Uh, and in Russian, the word they've come up with is clash, in the sense of an actual collision. Um, compromise. The word compromise in Russian, for most Russians, does not carry the positive connotation it carries in English. Compromise is a defeat. Now, that's changing, as attitudes are changing with a new generation. Enlightened self-interest. I defy anyone to translate that. <laughs> Enlightened self-interest. Simply can't be done. And then in Russian itself, you have con you have key concepts which really don't translate into English. Um, the Russian word for state, государство, actually means kingdom or that which belongs to the king. That which belongs to the king. And so Russians don't have they're acquiring it, the Western notion of property. Property comes from the state. It is given by the state and it is taken away by the state. And that's really how Putin rules. He divides the property among the people whose loyalty he needs and he secures that loyalty. And very effectively, it seems to me. So this, many Russian reformists are saying Russia can't really move forward until we have firm property rights. And I think they're right because more Russian, more educated Russians have emigrated in the last three years than at any time since the revolution. And many educated Russians stash their wealth and their children abroad because they're worried about it. Um, and as a Russian deputy finance minister said, what Russia exports is oil, young women, and future Nobel Prize laureates. It was when two, no two Russians won the Nobel Prize for Physics in 2010 at the University of Manchester, and they were asked by the BBC Russian service, will you return to Russia? They said, under no circumstances. And their answer was significant. Too much bureaucracy, too much corrupt corruption, and too much Idiocy. Um, so, as I say, in the, oh, the other mention, thing I'll mention the language, Teresa and um, everyone would know this well. Russian has a, um, a concept, voya, which is usually translated as freedom or liberty, but it doesn't mean that. What voya means is it's the untrammeled exercise of the human will with no inhibitions, be they from God or be they from the government. And many Russians really believe that Putin, no matter what his faults, is really the best man for the job because, and they believe, and Putin I'm sure believes this, democracy is bad for Russia. But if you introduce democracy, what you'll get is voya. And that will lead to chaos, and history teaches that in Russia, when you get chaos, you get bloodshed on a massive scale. So there's no doubt that Putin's popularity is declining. But Russian history, I think, has made many Russians deeply pessimistic. Most fundamental change will mean things get worse. There's an old Russian saying, what is the difference between a pessimist and an optimist? An optimist thinks things can get worse. <laughs> worth thinking about. <laughs> worth thinking about. One another couple of couple of other matters that were raised. Just quick. Yeah. Yeah. We've got three minutes. No. Um, the very important point about infrastructure. I thought the, the discussion was very useful about about ships. I mean, to this day, there is not an all-weather road linking Vladivostok and Moscow. Putin claims there is, I can assure you, it's not an all-weather <laughs> To this day, and if you look at a map of, the Mos of Russia's infrastructure, you'll see it's all concentrated west of the US. Then you get this huge blank. It's a very important point, and the Chinese claim they have an expression for Russia. They say that Russia suffers from big country disease. It's simply too big to be government effective. I think this is something Australians understand well. 
<laughs> Western Australia would probably like to become sovereign. You know, so, um, I think that's an important point. Um, the values gap was raised, and I thought that was really very important. Just very briefly, a couple of other comments. You saw Mr. Deripaska being lectured to by Mr. Putin. Give me my pen back sign here. I thought that was a terrific image of the way Russia actually functions today. I would take the view, I would assure you that Putin is the Tsar. He's the Tsar. He routinely keeps people waiting, CEOs of big companies, two hours. And whenever he appears before a foreign guest, he's got an entourage. Ministers, deputy prime ministers. It's a way of demonstrating that he's the Tsar. And when Russian, senior Russian visitors come to Australia and encounter the Prime Minister with a single advisor, they simply, you know, they're dumbfounded. Final point, Medvedev had no power. He was nominally president. Putin had the power. In Russia, Medvedev was comically known among the people as Chupa Chups. Chupa Chups is a little lollipop. <laughs> And the Russians would say, Medvedev achieved three things. He changed the clocks, because he tried to introduce change daylight saving. He changed the name of the militia to the police, Polizia, and he kept the seat warm for Putin. <laughs> Finally, will Putin retire? I don't think Putin can retire. The only way Putin can retire is if someone gives him a rock-solid guarantee that he will be safe. And you saw him there in that terrific shot that Teresa gave you with tears in his eyes when he had the acceptance speech. My suspicion is that Putin really believes that he could be overthrown. And there are only 80,000 people in the streets, really, out of a population of 140 million. Yet the reaction of the Kremlin was clearly one of genuine concern. So I think he really does believe that he could be threatened. And if he retired, who is going to protect him? So what will happen to Vladimir Putin? Probably even Vladimir Putin doesn't know. I'll okay. be talking to you further this afternoon. Thank, thanks very much indeed for our, our speakers. As <laughs> Kyle said, we'll return to the question of uh, Russia later on. Time for morning tea now, and when we come back, we pick up with the issue of leadership from a different perspective, looking at the European Union and global leadership. Bruce, uh, before, before we go, can we do